Welcome. Thank you. It's a yeah. pleasure to be here. Yeah. So, uh, so Dr. Galvin, that's quite the that's quite the resume you have there. Um, so, tell us a little bit more about your work at CSU Fullerton. So, my primary job is really threefold. Mm -hmm. Number one, I teach classes in nutrition, performance, strength, and conditioning. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, of course, our laboratories. So, in the Center for Sport Performance, we've got about seven different laboratories: uh, biomechanics, exercise physiology, sports psychology, um, human performance, uh, and, and motor control, motor learning. Uh, so really our job is to produce research that improves the human condition. We tend to focus on performance uh, and sport performance, but really as the talk probably evolves here, you'll probably start to understand how I think that is a little bit more wide ranging than some people understand. So if you improve sport performance, it's also a very good microcosm for understanding what improves that general human condition. So with that being said, the third tier really of my job is to disseminate that information that we learn in our, our laboratories and in our studies to the people that use it, whether that be the professional athletes, the UFC fighters, or whether that be you folks at home. That's also why I do the podcast and why I'm here today and, and why I wrote the book. Uh, and if you notice the tone of the book, it's written for the general public. It's not written like I uh, write with my scientific papers. And, and that's because we're trying to take the things we learn in our laboratory and put it into practice with the people that are going to use it and benefit from it. Got it. And so how did you go from, you know, leading a lab to working with Olympians and uh, professional MMA fighters? Well, that's really the same thing for me. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to be the participants and the subjects in my studies because oh, okay. uh, I'm trying to learn how muscle functions at the high level. Uh, specifically, what we do in our lab is we learn what regulates how muscle grows, shrinks, dies, and repairs. Mm -hmm. And it's important to understand that from the disease prevention treatment model. But it's also important to understand the other side of the equation, which is let's look at the athletes who are the best in the world because now we understand where we're trying to get to. And so there's a, a very natural crossover there between these are the people I'm trying to study, I'm learning information about them, well then let's take the information I know and give it back to them and see if we can actually change performance. Mm -hmm. And so it's really circular, it works really well that way, I get something out of it, they get something out of it. So it was a natural blend. Mm -hmm. So let's for a second assume that I'm a professional MMA fighter, which is highly unlikely because I have terrible vision, <laughs> tore my meniscus, and no neck tattoos. And you work at Google. And I work at Google. So yeah. probably not, yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably not, yeah. yeah. It's probably not a future career move, but let's for a second assume that. So would you work, would I only work with you, or would you be like part of a crew, of a team? My role whenever I'm working with an athlete or my mom mm -hmm. or anybody else is to do whatever I need to do mm -hmm. to improve that person or to get them. And if that means you need to work with me directly and only me, that's fine. If you need me to be the 43rd person on your team, mm -hmm. that's absolutely fine. My goal is not to have anyone ever do my system. Mm -hmm. I don't have a system. My goal is to figure out what your problem is and fix it. The easy example here, and I'm going to show you how bad I understand programming, but, but this works very easy. If you had a problem with uh, some software that wasn't working appropriately, you, you can't just send the same piece of code to fix everything. It's easier to just look at the current code, fix the one problem, and then go back. That's all I'm trying to do. And we have a major fallacy of assuming everyone has that same problem. So the answer to your question is, I'm trying to find whatever role I can mm -hmm. to help the person through their problem or to improve them if they don't have a problem. And so I've played every role you can imagine. Some of the athletes I work with, I'm pretty high at the top, and I'm determining what's going on. Some of them, it's very low-level stuff. Uh, I'm always trying to encourage interaction with all their coaches, their physicians, their staff members, their agents, whatever I can, to help them fix the problem or, or improve what they're trying to improve. That's my circular goal. It's about them, not me. Mm -hmm. Got it. And I suppose like having that approach makes it so that working with so many smart folks, like you're not stepping on one another's toes because you're there for the individual, not for yourself. Th that's probably my single biggest piece of advice when working with an athlete. Mm -hmm. They have to understand that because they will see right through that as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of people want to work with professional athletes or any high-level functioning person. It doesn't matter if it's a professional athlete. They want to work with that person so that they can level up. Mm -hmm. right? I want this person to succeed so that they can go around and tell the media that I got better because of Andy. Right? Mm -hmm. And an athlete will see right through that. And so you have to actually have that altruistic nature where you're saying, I'm just trying to help this person because I want to help that person. If you do it because you want to level up or get fame or fortune from it, it's not going to work. So my approach is that way because I'm really genuinely trying to help them. 
Most of the athletes that I've worked with have never mentioned me on their Twitter feed. They've never posted about me, and that's fine. That's not what I do. But occasionally, if they do it, that's great. But the point is to help them get better. Um, and in a job like mine, working directly with the athletes is not actually part of my job. Mm -hmm. my, my, I have laboratories to run. You heard of all the things I'm doing. I have classes to teach. I have other service to do. I'm on national boards and uh, scientific advisory panels and things like that. So when I work with them, that, that's a hobby for the most part. Uh, it goes in that category in my brain, anyways, in terms of my workflow. And so I treat it like that, which means I'm going to do this from the altruistic perspective of it gives me enjoy, or enjoyment or joy. Uh, I enjoy it. And I like to help people. So if I think I can offer somebody some help, I will. But I'm not doing it for me because I got, I got names everywhere. I got books. I got titles. I got awards. Like, got labs. That's the last thing I need. Yeah. That's the last thing I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something that really stood out about your work, and I mentioned this to you before we walked in, was that it's both really refreshing yeah. but also really frustrating Yeah. because I'm like, am I keto? Do I not do keto? Like, which diet is the best for me? And I think, um, you know, there's, th there's this idea that it's a one-size-fits-all mentality for both fitness and nutrition. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit on kind of like the nuance and kind of the way you would approach, let's say, forming a diet for uh, a high-performing Olympian. I think the best way I can set this whole story up is uh, a few years ago, my students walked into my classroom on the last day before the final and told me that they weren't going to take the final, that they just handed and they pulled out from their bag a big bag of diapers. And they said, this is our answer for every question because the answer is always, it just depends. <laughs> right? And then that's, that's pretty there's a time delay there yeah. in the joke there. I know. Yeah. Give it a second. Mm -hmm. but, but that's what you're referring to in terms of frustrating because that is always the answer. Mm -hmm. Physiology is so complex. And the reason, even if you had two or 200 people that had the same quote unquote problem, it may not have this, the same reason why the problem's there. And so if you give them the same treatment, it may or may not be effective. Mm -hmm. And so I never give people blanket statements. I will use any tool to fix a job. And oftentimes you have innumerable tools that could fix it, and you have to go to your next level of thinking and logic to figure out which one do I choose, because a thousand of them could. I mean, example up here, I've got two different water bottles up here. Mm -hmm. They're not identical, and if my problem was hydration, there's pros and cons to both approaches here. Right? And so I'm not trying to just say, all right, everyone drink this because it's better. Everyone drink this, don't drink this because it's worse. Mm -hmm. I want to look through every piece of evidence, what all possible could be going on here, what all is possible going on here, and understand the pros and cons of implementing that in for my solution. And that's always what's going through my brain. There, we'll get to this, I'm sure, in a second. But there's no free passes in physiology. Mm -hmm. Everything does something. And so you have to consider both the potential help and the potential consequence of anything you implement, whether that's food, whether it's supplement, whether it's a sleep thing, it's technology. Of course, this is what the book is about. There are pros and cons to everything. Everything has an effect. And now when you start putting that into a system like physiology that is so complex, you have to understand when you turn a switch, it doesn't go on and off. Mm -hmm. It does a bunch of different things in physiology. So the game board is constantly moving. When you adjust one piece, it doesn't just do one thing. It adjusts a thousand other things, millions of other things, really. Mm -hmm. And so you have to factor all that stuff in. And at the end of the day, you're guessing. And anyone that says anything different in, in mechanical biology or, or perhaps in software stuff, you have a very math, is a very clear, you do this, it turns into that. Physiology does not work like that. It is way too complex. It's biology, it's, it's too moving, right? Um, the understanding or, or clarity of truth in biological or medicine is really, really difficult to get to. And so you have to have that humility when you, when you treat people, when you work with athletes, understanding think this is how it's going to work based on my experience and the evidence and everything else I've been through. But at the end of the day, you don't know. You're just guessing. So what would be an example of like of that trade-off of like, let's say um, the example I've heard you use before is like vitamin C. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah so can you share a little bit about the, the counterbalance of, you know, taking in vitamin C as a supplement? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, use, I'll make an easier one. Mm -hmm. uh, vitamins and minerals are the easy go-to because if you just take vitamin C prophylactically, so you just took it all day every day, there's consequences to that. It has extreme toxicity. The idea here is called hormesis, mm -hmm. which means there's, there's a toxicity curve to everything. And water, I'll give you, I'll go to here because it's an even easier example which sets the point better. How many of you would be willing to stop drinking water the rest of your life? <laughs> nope. <laughs> right, not too many hands going up there. So you would all agree being very low in hydration is a problem, right? And you've heard this a thousand times, drink more water, it's better for you, right? Do you all realize 
that if you drink enough water, that will kill you? Like you, you all know this, right? There's a toxicity curve with water. The most inert thing on the planet has a toxicity curve. If you drink too much of it, you get what's called hyponatremia. Right? The, the sodium, potassium pumps the things, are your, the reasons why you have an electrical gradient between the muscles that cause contraction becomes diluted, nothing pumps, the heart stops pumping, right? There's a toxicity curve to water. Mm -hmm. I'll use an easier one. How many of you are willing to go 15 minutes without oxygen? Is that if a you also <laughs> Do you also realize oxygen is probably the most toxic thing on the planet? Like, this is rust, right? This is a, oxidized. This is the problem here. So vitamin C is no different. Pick your mineral. Um, iron is a big one in men. Sometimes men have too much iron. Women have the same problem. If you just give people prophylactic iron, especially women, this is a common one we see because of the menstrual cycle, we'll just give women more iron. Well, fantastic. That causes all kinds of oxidative problems. It causes all kinds of damage to DNA. There's a ton of issues with that if you're giving them too much. Mm -hmm. So you can't just give people things. There's, this is what I said a minute ago. There are no free passes in physiology. Nothing is good, nothing is bad. You, you, look, you have to stop thinking about molecules mm -hmm. and personifying them. Like, there's no little evil body in a water molecule that's like, yes, let me get the human. Yeah. I will get it, right? Two or like, oh, gallons. I just want to help people, right? That, you know, the movie Inside, Inside Out or whatever it was? Yeah, but like, yeah. The, the molecules are not people. A, a piece of water doesn't give a, I almost, I almost said a different word, doesn't care mm -hmm. if you're happy or sad or anything like that. Vitamin C is not toxic for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you pick the worst, most toxic thing on the planet. It doesn't have a personality. It doesn't care. Even sugar? Yes. Sugar. Like, sugar doesn't hate you. <laughs> None of these things. It's always about hormesis. Where is it on the curve? And the crazy thing is, pick any of these vitamins, minerals, or any uh, pharmacologically developed item, at some point it could save your life. It could be the, the thing that changes how you feel. It could also be the thing that kills you or makes you feel worse. Right? If you go further, it could kill you. So this is what I mean with all, all those things. You have to understand where you're at on that curve. And a large part of it is you can get blood work done, but that's a very crude measure. Mm -hmm. Really, it's about understanding how you feel because your body will tell you things. And it turns out, Nature has figured out a lot of this hormetic curve pretty well. The amount of minerals, for example, vitamin C, that you can get through nature are generally fine. Hardly any of you are likely to be at a past the hormetic curve where you're going to have physiological problems by consuming too many oranges. You're not going to get that much vitamin C because there's not that much vitamin C in the orange. right? It has a dosage that says this is probably going to be appropriate. Where well, you can get into a problem, though, is taking things at dosages that are way higher than, nat than normal in, in nature. So super concentrated exogenous things like a pill. Right? Now you can get grams of vitamin C at a time. This is something you would have never gotten in the natural world. And we have to be careful here of not making the natural fallacy, mm -hmm. right? which, which is, is that just, things, just because things are this way in nature, that means it's good. That's, that's not true. Mm -hmm. But it is fairly reasonable in this context to say that the sugar would be the same thing, and we can certainly dive into that. Mm -hmm. It's not the fact that uh, there's too much sugar in a carrot, right? It's the fact that the way that people often consume sugar now, it's in extremely concentrated forms that would have not, you would have had to eat four bundles of carrots to get that much sugar, or a beet for that, for that matter too. So that's really the, the issue with all those things is we're not consuming those things or we are consuming those things in concentrations or dosages that, that our physiology is not really prepared for. So then um, to bring back, kind of back to the local level then, how can we take that information and apply it to like our day-to-day -day here at Google? Um, is it like? Is there like a best practice? Do you just like adjust your eating based on the activities Turns that you do? Turns out there is a best practice, and it's all laid out right here. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah. I'm just kidding. Mm. I'm not really, but that's mm -hmm. that's really what I'm talking about. The, the the best practice number one is to treat the problem, not the symptom. That's the issue. So, for example, if we'll just keep writing vitamin C since so you brought it up. Why do people generally take vitamin C prophylactically? Uh, they feel sick, they're about to get sick. Perfect, right? If you're taking that all the time because every two or three weeks you feel like you're getting sick or you are getting sick, mm -hmm. that will cover up the symptom, may even fix it. But what's the problem? Something in your lifestyle or diet or nutrition or sleep is wrong. That's why you keep getting sick. 
So you need to fix that problem. Now you can take the vitamin C once or twice or something when you've got a crazy month and you've got to get this project or you're over. All right, fine. But you have to realize that is the symptom that your body is trying to tell you you're doing something wrong. So at some point you have to, got to go back and fix the problem, mm -hmm. right? And that could be a whole bunch of things. It's terribly boring, mm -hmm. but I generally will apply the same problem or the solution for that problem to everyone. Mm -hmm. You're probably not sleeping well and consistently. You're probably not eating enough high quality food. You're probably eating too much low quality things and you're probably not getting enough physical exercise. Like most boring talk ever, right? <laughs> Turns out it's really, really true. That's why we say it, right? Cliches are there for a reason. Mm -hmm. Stereotypes are there for a reason. They're generally pretty true most of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're pretty, like at the general level, they're, they're pretty accurate. At the general, very general level, right? Mm -hmm. That's what they're there for, though. We're mm -hmm. trying to generalize. We're trying to give big sweeping recommendations for everybody, and it turns out those are the sweeping recommendations that work really well. Mm -hmm. So it, we'll get into this concept right now, I guess. I think the easiest way I can explain this is you, on two ends here. Over here, you have optimization. And this is something actually very applicable to all of you. And over here is adaptation. So one of the things you have to realize about physiology, when you're optimizing, you're not adapting. Right? Or you can think of it as you're super adapting. So if you're walking around at all times optimizing, you're actually causing the system to be more reliant upon that optimization. I'll give you an example. The easy one I can pick on here is caffeine. So how many of you out there are willing to, we're in the trust circle here, don't worry, I'm only judging everything you're doing right now. <laughs> but how many of you are willing to acknowledge that um, you're a, a daily consumer of caffeine? I like to party. I like to party. Mm -hmm. Virtually every hand goes up, right? Mm -hmm. How many of you think your day is significantly enhanced or improved by that caffeine? How many of you, we'll keep going one step further, are actually willing to admit that if you were to not get that caffeine dose in the morning, your productivity or some other function you see as positive would, would be compromised? Right. So what happens with caffeine over time to your ability for, or its effectiveness over time? It diminishes. So you're optimizing by taking that caffeine. And I'm not against caffeine. I'm going to go against this entirely in a second. I just picked this one because it's a very easy one that I knew all, all your hands would go up, right? I, I, like, I get it. I'm a full-time scientist. I run laboratories. I teach four classes a semester. I write books. I do things like this. I don't have any time either, right? I work with athletes. We're all in that same time crunch. I truly believe most people work about equally hard, right? None of us have any free time. So you're constantly optimizing. You're doing what makes you feel the best right now because you've got to get this thing done. But then what happens? There's another project comes up and then another project comes up. And you end up in this constantly optimizing everything, right? I'm taking my nootropic. I'm taking um, my other vitamin C pill so I don't get sick, right? I won't fix the lifestyle stuff. I'll optimize everything right now. I'll take all the caffeine I can to get through this project, right? But then I need more and more and more. And then eventually what happens? Boom. You blow to pieces, right? Physiology shuts down because it became so reliant on the technology. What happens if you stop taking that caffeine? Headache. Withdrawal symptoms, right? All these problems happen, and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't stop taking the caffeine. Because you chose optimization. Is that the same thing with diet? Like, like uh, if I were you know, to be 100% keto and then I couldn't get that type of food and I had to switch to something else, would, would there be a similar reaction? S similar idea, but yeah, you've become what we would say is non-resilient. Mm -hmm. right? You don't want to put yourself in a position where you can't handle things. You want to have some grit. So I actually think it's great when people say, hey, look, I know if I do these four or five things in the morning, I become extremely clear and productive. Mm -hmm. That's good. I want you all to know those things. I just don't want you to choose those every single time. So in the book we talk about you have to engineer and manufacture suffering sometimes. You have to choose the hard path sometimes. And you do that so that this doesn't get slid too far to the right. Because then you end up optimizing so much that optimal doesn't work anymore. You've got to optimize more. And you've got to optimize more. And now we're no longer having an effect. And what do you think is happening to the physiology? If you have to have caffeine to wake up in the morning, what do you think happens to those endogenous processes that are there to help you wake up? They become dull. Right? Desensitized. They go away. And eventually, years later, 
months later, weeks later, or whatever happens to me, this becomes a problem. And so the answer to your question, what's the actionable step, what can we do here at Google, is yeah, sometimes have caffeine or have whatever you're looking for, and, and again, caffeine is just the one to pick on, but then sometimes say, you know what, I'm going to perform today, I'm going to execute, I'm going to be focused today without that stuff. Help the body learn to go back the other direction too, so that it learns to do that. So you don't have to have those things, you don't have to have 250 grams of fat a day just to not feel foggy headed. Right? If that's a problem, you should learn to build in what's called metabolic flexibility. Mm -hmm. right? So I'll grant you, some people are probably very dominant on carbohydrate, overly dominant. But that doesn't mean you should become overly dominant in fat burning either. That's just the same thing, but at the other end of the spectrum. I want people to be able to do both, go back and forth. So if you're in a situation where a lot of carbohydrates are available, you can consume them, or you want to. For, for a thousand reasons, you just want to have some carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. I want you to have the physiology to go through that and not blow up the next day, or eight days later, or fall asleep, or whatever other silliness people say, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with fat. I want you to also not have to go through your day without having to have carbohydrate. I think that is also equally a problem. I don't think it's very clear this is an issue, right? So your gut health, your brain function, your energy level should all have the resiliency to handle multiple different stimuli. This is where we're going to be optimal. And the more time you can say, pushing away from optimization, spending in adaptation, the more things get better. You don't need to do those things as much. Mm -hmm. all right, so again, I'm not saying, all right, let's throw away all of our things. Let's go back to just living on water and, and broccoli. And No, I'm just saying sometimes choose suffering, mm -hmm. sometimes choose optimization. And if you can th think to yourself and go, oh, boy, you know what? I haven't chose suffering in a long time, but then that's probably time to choose some suffering. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's weekly, monthly. I don't know what it is. It doesn't matter. But just having that, and this is actually why the last word in the book is consciousness, just having that awareness to go, oh, yeah, all right, and maybe it's time that I sleep for 10 hours for five straight days. Right? It's really interesting what people will choose to suffer with. Some people will choose to suffer through exercise, but they won't suffer through any hunger. Or they won't suffer through eating something. They don't, I don't like that. Like, what? You ran 20 miles yesterday, but you won't eat something because you don't like the taste of it? That last five seconds? That's the craziest thing. Some people will work and sleep five hours a night for weeks on end, but they won't do the opposite in the spectrum, which is, okay, choose five days in a row where you sleep for 10 hours. They won't choose that type of suffering because they don't like it. They're bored or I'm agitated. I, know I, can't get, I can't sleep at night, so I'm going to pull up my phone and get my... No, 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 no. Put that away. That's your suffering, is not checking your phone every two seconds. Whatever your suffering happens to be, pick something that's hard and just make sure. And, and I use these examples like caffeine, but I want really um, the goal of the book and the goal right here today is to help you think about other aspects of your life. Maybe that's paying attention to your wife more. Right? Maybe that's not reacting to somebody in traffic as much. Choose the optimization. Choose what feels good. Choose what gets you fixed the fastest right now but then sometimes choose what's going to be the long-term solution. And it's the same thing I talked about. This is fixing the problem versus the symptom. The symptom is I woke up today exhausted. I got to get as much of stuff done. The symptom is fatigue, but the problem was lifestyle. The problem was lifestyle. So yeah. balance those two things. Yeah, something I've noticed a lot, and, and um, this might have come up a couple a couple times before, but it's I feel that our peer group, especially here you know, at Google, we're all you know around the same age. We do similar activities, but we try to optimize for too many things. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, like in my own personal case, like you know, I try to be ketogenic and also do jujitsu. And you know, halfway through a role, I mean, you oh. practice the sport as well, and like halfway yeah. through the role, I'm just like, yeah, I'm not going for that triangle. I'm dead, man. Like I'm. Like, I can't do yeah. anything else. And so I had to switch back to, like, okay, like, let's get more carbs in you. Let's get you a little bit re more ready and full so that when you're rolling, like, those carbs are activated and you have that energy. Yeah. But, like, I couldn't do both at the same time. And so I had to pick one or the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's a very good example. When you try to make changes, mm -hmm. so sometimes you have to be realistic with the expectations, right? Not sometimes. It's pretty much all. Mm -hmm. In that particular case, you had to understand what the true goal was. Are you trying to get jiu-jitsu, mm -hmm. better jiu-jitsu right now? Or are you trying to get keto adapted? Because sometimes those things are going to be antithetical. Right? Mm -hmm. You have to understand, if you don't make that decision of what the true goal is a priori, mm -hmm. you'll never get through that, that change because when things get hard, you're going to start making a change in your decision. right? So the goal has to be, I'm going to get keto adapted. That means 
if you're wanting to. Yeah. I will stay with keto. And if that means jiu-jitsu suffers right now, fine. I have to do that because I have to recognize the goal is over here. Mm -hmm. Or if the goal is to be getting better at jiu-jitsu for that week, month, block, whatever it happens to be, this is strength conditioning programming 101, right? Mm -hmm. Have a goal for the day, week, month, quarter, year. Mm -hmm. and then understand, be true to that goal. So when things start going wrong, you look back up the chain and go, yeah, well, the goal of this week was this, and the goal of this month was that. Therefore, here's my decision. Mm -hmm. And I understand what to optimize for and what to push towards adaptation. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, um, that ability to, be, to change up uh, your eating style, so would that also apply to like working out? Like, is there a variability in strength and conditioning too that you would recommend? 100%. There should be variability with all of these things. Mm -hmm. You should look at your lifestyle, whether that's your, nutri your nutrition, your exercise programming stuff, and think, When's the last time I did something different? You should think globally, right? So how many of you think it'd be good to do the same workout every day the rest of your life? Like, I got eye rolls there, right? Of course, that doesn't make any sense. Then why do you think there's one eating style you should do the rest of your life? That doesn't make any sense either, right? So you shouldn't just be keto the rest of your life. You shouldn't be carb heavy the rest of your life. You shouldn't do any of these things the rest of your life. You can if you want, but there's no real reason that you should have one, there's one way to eat ever, but yet there's a thousand different ways to exercise. It doesn't make any sense, right? If you start going back up the logic train, you start thinking, what am I trying to do with the exercise, right? And you have, many, many of us have different goals, including things like I'm trying to get healthier, I'm trying to lose weight, right? Or I, I want more energy. When you think about what the goal is, that actually determines the outcome as opposed to working backwards, which is to say, I'm going to do this, this program. Why? Because my friend did it and loved it. <laughs> that goes back to what we said earlier. Well, your friend might have been doing it for a different reason, or it's super popular for a different reason. You have to think about what are you trying to get at it, and this is, I won't do this one right now because I'm sure none of you want to be this honest, <laughs> but if generally you've, I'm sure, heard the, the rule of three Ys, W-Y, W-H-Y, right? It's three to five. But when, you, when somebody comes at you with a problem in the terms of nutrition or diet, and you say, I want to get X, at why? Mm -hmm. Why do you care about that? Why do you care about that? Why do you assume if you did this, it would do that? And that's always what it comes down to. There's almost always a broken assumption. Why are you assuming if you eat less carbohydrates, you're going to lose more fat? Well, it just makes sense. That's it? You're going to change your whole lifestyle because of that? Oh, well, what do you really want to do? I really just want to lose fat. Great. So if I give you a plan to lose fat, would you be happy? Yes or no? Yes, and if you lost the fat, would you be happy? Yes or no? Yes, I would be. Great. Well, then I'm going to use whatever tool I can to, put, to help you lose fat. You brought a solution. You brought an, an option there, which is a fine option. But I'm going to look at the rest of the things and say, that's not going to work in your lifestyle. I know you got kids. I know you've got this thing going on. This is, not, I'm, this is not very unlikely to succeed for you. So can I offer you another option that I think is more likely to succeed that will get you that goal? That's what I'm after. That's what we're always doing. So with exercise, it's the same thing. What are we trying to do here? I'm trying to, well, my mom had uh, osteoporosis, so I, don't, I want to make sure I don't have that. Oh, OK. Or my dad just had a heart attack, and so I'm really thinking about long-term health. Or, hey, look, it's summertime. It's Venice. I need to get ready to pop this shirt off. <laughs> Fine. Like, whatever happens to be, let's get to the honest answer. And people are shocked, because I don't care. I actually don't think vanity is the worst thing ever here. If that drives you to exercise more, okay, that, that can be a problem at the end of the hormesis curve, just like anything else, right? But for a lot of people, fine, if that's what it takes, well, then let's talk about that. And now we're going to work backwards to figure out what program or style of training you need to do to get that goal as opposed to just picking a style of training. Like, that doesn't make any sense at all. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when the goal changes, now we're going to rotate training philosophies mm -hmm. based on what the next goal is. And so speaking of training and, like, genetics, like, how much of what you have is, like, fixed? Like, assuming, again, that I become, a, you, know, yeah. a, you know, the best Mexican-American UFC fighter ever, yeah. um, you know, how much of that is limited by what I already have? Or can I completely change my build? Or am I kind of just stuck yeah. as is? So we've actually ran a, a recent trial with some monozygous twins. Mm -hmm. So these are twins that have the exact same DNA. So they're clones. And one of them had stopped exercising when he was about 18 or 20 years old. And the other one had continued to exercise. And at the time when we tested them, they were in their early 50s. So really 30 years of different exercise training. And while everything that you in your body is slightly different here, mm -hmm. uh, generally at worst, you're talking about 50-50 genetics and lifestyle. Some of the markers, more aggressive, some of the things that we saw were closer to 80-20 in favor of lifestyle 
Really? Not genetics. Uh, the exposome is what some people refer to this. Okay. I think not genetic. So it depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about something like how tall you are, that's pretty much 100% genetic, right? There's not a lot we can do. Sorry. Sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at something like uh, your overall health, or I'll, I'll pick a maybe more specific example. We took muscle biopsies, and we analyzed them for fiber type. Mm -hmm. right? So most of you heard there's fast twitch muscle fibers and slow twitch, right? Well, unlike what most people think, there is tremendous plasticity within that. So you can swing back. You can go from fast to slow, slow to fast really quickly. We've seen changes in fiber type in as short as two weeks, uh, 11 days, really. And in this particular case, one of the twins was about 50-50 fast twitch and slow twitch, and the other one was about 90% slow twitch. So I really, basically for things like, again, height, you can't really change. But anything that has any plasticity to it, there really is no limit to how much it changes. It only comes down to exposure. Mm -hmm. So the more often you do it, the longer you have to do it. For example, if I took these twins and I had another 100 years to keep them going, they would continue to change. It's not a physiological limit. It's just a limit to exposure, time and load, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have unlimited ability to change virtually anything about you if you give it enough exposure. So that means you have to be patient and you have to do things often. If you're consistent, you do it often, and you wait time. Basically, anything about your body, your physique, and especially things like muscle, it has virtually no limit to plasticity within our lifestyle or within our lifetime at this stage. So everything really can change. Got it. And now, how, how related is that to like the idea of epigenetics, that some things turn off and on depending on what you do? Is that, does this go back to the twin example you just shared? Yeah, that is one example of that. So you have genes that you can't change. You can't change the DNA that you've inherited. Uh, but we've been doing this for, for decades now. The idea that just because you have a gene doesn't mean that gene is going to be expressed. If that gene is not expressed, no proteins are built. No proteins are built, nothing happens. So somebody that say that gets a bad draw, because certainly people get better draws genetically and some get worse. Mm -hmm. So for, let's say, oh, I'll give you an example for myself. Um, I've done a bunch of genetic testing, and I have a lot of markers for obesity. And so if you calculate the rough numbers, I have something like 15 or 16x the risk of obesity. And I'm not the, uh, the best looking person you've ever seen with their shirt off over there on the beach, but it's not too bad, right? Everyone else in my family is obese. Everyone, for the most part. I have the same, I have very bad genetics when it comes to those things. I have to work very hard in my exercise and nutrition. It's not just natural. I wasn't born with a fast metabolism. That's all garbage. Mm -hmm. right. I have the genetic markers that give me every excuse to be obese. But if I don't match that with the lifestyle, those genes are never going to really matter that much. If, though, I gave my lifestyle a little bit, it would take off. Some people get a lot, some people even have much higher on the, the obesity thing than I, and they match that, they eat pretty well. Their lifestyle's pretty good, but that's enough to really send them off the edge, right? And so they have to work really hard and do everything to just kind of stay there. Some people are on the other end of that spectrum. It doesn't really matter what they do, they're not going to be in the surface level obese. But keep in mind, a major misnomer here is skinny is not healthy, and obese is not unhealthy necessarily either. Adding more fat mass is generally never a good thing for your health. But just because you're not fat does not mean you're healthy. And we have tremendous data on this, uh, hundreds of thousands of people now, mm -hmm. in uh, dozens of studies across laboratories across the world. Some of the most significant predictors of mortality, so this is when you're going to die, are things like leg strength. It's not obesity. It's things like VO2 max. It's not your cholesterol. So you could be somebody who is quote unquote skinny, have weak legs, have a low VO2 max, and be at two to three times, if not higher, the mortality risk of somebody who's a little bit overweight, but they have a reasonable VO2 max and a reasonable leg strength because they're active. Mm -hmm. Like if you want to talk about health, that's what health means. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on are you talking about aesthetics or health. But those are different conversations. Just because you're not fat is, does not mean you're healthy. You could be right above that line of dying. Got it. And so speaking of lifestyle, you have this wonderful analogy where you describe the differences in, in terms of eating between a cook, oh, yeah. a baker, and a chef. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love for you to, to share a little bit about that. So like any analogy, 
It's not perfect, right? But what I try to do is, as I mentioned, it's a little bit of blend of the soft sciences and the hard sciences. I'm a hard scientist, right? Mm -hmm. It's quantitative versus qualitative. Everything in my world is quantitative. Biopsy, you measure everything. Molecules, we measure signaling proteins, genes, things like that. And there's no fudging. There's no, oh, look like you look pretty good. <laughs> that, that doesn't work in muscle physiology. But the soft sciences are more qualitative, right? And so what I try to do is, when I'm speaking to a client, an athlete, or even a student, or even my parents, or you right now, there's two conversations that go on in my head. Conversation number one is, what's the information? What's the thing I'm trying to say? Conversation number two is, what's the best way I need to say it to you to have the impact? Right? If I give you every piece of information I know in my head, you can't execute. And it, oftentimes, that confuses you even more and makes you go, I'm out. Like, I just wanted one answer. I would have started taking vitamin C. Do I do it? Yes or no? Like, <laughs> I'm out. So you have to have two conversations going to translate what I think I need to say to you. So my analogy that I make up with the cook, baker, and chef is my way of putting people in personality categories for one simple metric, which is nutrition. And that helps me understand how I need to communicate with them. And it actually works really well because people fall into this cook, baker, chef analogy in every aspect of their life, but you may switch back. So when you go to work here in a second, you might be a baker. But then with your own nutrition, you might be a cook. So people aren't just a cook or a baker in all aspects of life. It changes depending on the rules. So for example, for me, and I'll get into what this cook, baker, chef thing is in a second. For nutrition, I am definitely a cook. But when it comes to my taxes, <laughs> not, not, like, not the same way, right? When it comes to fixing my car, I'm totally a baker, right? I'm, I'm following every instruction. I'm not. I kind of feel here, right? This might go here. Let's just put that there. Right. And so the easy analogy is, do any of you know the difference between cooking and baking? I sort of just gave you a hint. Baking is chemistry. Right? Baking is extremely precise. You cannot do things in different orders when you <laughs> bake. You can't be like, well, I'll just get the baking powder out. Just toss them in. Like, not going to work. Like, was that baking soda or baking powder? I can't remember. Just throw one of them in. Oh, I put a little bit of both. <laughs> Not going to work in uh, chemistry, right? It's the YOLO move. Just put in both, see what happens. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> Generationals, millennials. That's what you do, right? Cooking is that, though, right? Cooking is, well, OK, yeah, you just kind of get it hot, put it in the pan, uh, put a little bit of this, put a little bit of that in there. Well, it doesn't really matter if you have onion or not. OK, add it. It's not going to kill it. Just kind of toss things around, right? So people process information the same way. How many of you, if I said, look, for having me up here today, I'm going to actually go ahead and offer you my services for free for the next 30 days. I'll be your personal nutritionist the next 30 days. No charge. Uh, how many of you, if I said, look, I will write you a specific program. I'll tell you exactly what to eat, when to eat it. You have to weigh. You have to buy a little scale. You have to weigh every single thing you eat. And you have to report it back to me. And if you fail one meal, I'm out. How many of you would love something like that? Right? How many of you were like, well, what if I just, we met like once a week for 30 minutes or an hour, you could ask me a couple questions, I gave you some concepts, and then you went back. How many of you would like that? Right. You are a baker. You're cooks. If, if we work together, and now especially if you paid me, if you're paying me $1,000 a month to do this, and you wanted that kind of information at that level of detail, and all I gave you was, well, you know, just a little more protein. <laughs> like you'd be pissed, right? You'd, like, you'd be freaking out. Like, was I, the great example I give all the time is my wife, because she is a baker when it comes to food. So when I first started helping her years ago with her nutrition, you know, I'd be like, oh, OK, this is a little bit of, um, little bit of walnuts, uh, walnuts today at lunch. She'd be like, whoa, whoa, what do you mean? Like, like eight almonds or walnuts, <laughs> 11? What are we talking about here? Because yeah. right, she came, she's a baker, plus she came from that counting calorie thing. She came from all this. And she, she gave her anxiety to not have that information. You, if I gave you all that information, it would give you anxiety because you're like, oh my god, it's controlling my life. Mm -hmm. It's too much. So even though the answer to all of your nutritional problems will just say is the exact same thing, I cannot communicate to you how I communicate to the rest of you. It's going to be ineffective. So I have to have that second conversation which says, OK, how does she want to hear this information? And what do I need to tell her? I can't give her too much, I can't give her too little. There's a thing called buy-in, right? You've got to be convinced and excited it's going to work. 
and it's going to be overload. I've got to make sure that I'm trying to line you up with buy-in as well as feeling good about, yeah, no, I see why you gave me walnuts because this was going on. And I see why you added this because we were here. Perfect. That's going to fix my problems. You might not care about that. You're like, look, I just want to be a little bit less fat. Give me some ideas. What am I doing wrong? Cool. And you're really empowered by that. You're excited by that versus added anxiety to your plan, right? So bakers need to be given very specific instructions, even, here's the secret, even if those instructions aren't perfectly right. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. I don't know if you need to be on 180 grams of carbohydrate or 280. But if I told you that, you wouldn't be happy. But if I walked down and said, oh, yeah, no, you need to be at 175, exactly. Don't go to 190. Be at 175. Uh -huh. You went, oh, sweet, great. And I turned around, I don't know. <laughs> you would rather hear that than not hear that, because you have a plan. Some of you are planners, right? Some of you like that detail. And we can adjust the plan as we go. So you can, a week, come back to me and go, look, I'm feeling boom, 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 boom. Oh, OK. Let's take those carbs. Let's go up to 220. See what happens. OK, great. You just like having a plan. Right? Some of you don't want that. It's too much. It's going to take over your life. You're not going to execute it. And the number one thing with diet nutrition, the number one thing to actually changing something is adherence. If nobody does the plan, then there is no plan. So my cook, baker, chef thing is trying to help people put them in a position where they actually might execute the plan. So give them something they're going to be excited about that doesn't give too much anxiety. Now, what's a chef? Is a chef following recipes or not? Not really. Why can a chef not follow recipes? Because they followed the recipe exactly for so many years, they have an advanced degree in that. Now they understand when to break those rules. They understand the, the consequences. They understand how things are working to a level. They can innovate. They can do things differently because they know, OK, well, I'm going to do less of that, but I've got to do this on the back end. A cook doesn't have that experience or knowledge. They didn't put in the groundwork, the years of working, to understand, no, you can't just throw the oil in yet. It's going to blow up, and you're going to splatter hot oil over your face. Right? But the chef probably did that a bunch of times. That's how they learned that, those lessons. And now they can break rules because they understand, well, you can do this, 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 but you can't do that. But you can break that, 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 and that, and that. Right? So a chef is somebody that understands those rules to such a level, I can go, boom. And I can weave back and forth between communicating like a baker or a cook with them. And I'm confident they won't break those fundamental rules that I didn't want them to break. Or my ideal goal, of course, is to work everyone up to being a chef to where I can go, sweet, just call me when you need me. Mm -hmm. right? With any of these things, I'm trying to, and this is really a big part of the book, I'm trying to push people away from becoming self-dependent, becoming self-reliant. If you have to follow a textbook or an app to eat every day, you're becoming dependent on that. right? That's not what we want you to do. We want you to be self-reliant, where you can go, OK, this was a great starting place. This helped me learn my body more. This diet that I followed, and I followed it to a T. I didn't make any variations in it. I learned a lot more about what I react well to and what I don't react to. It great. Now I'm going to ditch the book, ditch the plan, ditch the magic thing, and start changing things on my own. Oh, no, I understand. The book. That triggered me really fast. Oh my gosh, now I'm feeling super tired, and I'm nodding off after lunch. OK, it's because I added this. I can't do that. i got to make this combination different. right? And so it should be used to help you advance, not regress you back to, well, oh, I don't have my book. My app crashed. My phone died. Oh, my God, I don't know what to eat for lunch. <laughs> like, that's what happens, right? And we don't want you to be at that level. So you don't want to give people, when you give people very specific answers, they become reliant upon those answers. And they don't become, or they become dependent upon those answers. They don't become self-reliant. And that's really where we're trying to get people to get there. Because anyone who's ever had a significant change in their health, function, or performance, it is a lifestyle change. And that's what we're always trying to get people to get to. If you make them dependent upon external forces, information, if you make them be a perma baker, they're never going to become a chef. But if you're always a cook as well, you'll never know what to do to become a chef either. So there's a little bit of both we have to go back to. So that's generally what I do. So when I'm working with an athlete, in my head I go, OK, all right, Steve. All right, he's a baker. I'm filtering everything through. Bakers do well with a bunch of instructions, very specific detail. Cooks, short piece of information, and do, they don't care why. 
right? So for, we'll go back to, again, where I'm working with you all as a nutritionist. If I gave you, I said, hey, I want you to take 11 walnuts and eat those at 11 a.m., 11, not 12, you'd probably go, cool, great, I'm in, but why? You wouldn't give a shit. You'd be like, sweet, I'm on it, let me go, 11, here we are, we're done. <laughs> Cooks don't care about the why. Bakers tend to care about the why. So the baker, I spend more time with the buy-in of explaining to them how it's gonna work. Well, it's because we saw this in your blood panel, we saw this in your stool sample, we're doing this. Okay, great, bakers, or cooks just want to know the answer. Great, not questioning it, I'm in, I'm out. Come back in a month. Let me know if it didn't work, great. Mm -hmm. And so it's just trying to help improve communication. And my decade as a teacher has helped me build that. So although I'm a hard scientist, I'm a qualitative sci or quantitative scientist by nature, I'm also, a, I spend a lot of time teaching. And so really I developed that as a tool with both my students and my athletes as a way of saying, okay, how can I change my system so that I can improve for them? I'm, try, I'm not trying to make all of my athletes chefs or all of my students. Some don't want to be. Some of you might realize like, look, nutrition is not my jam. I, I want to be healthier, but I'm not, I'm not going to dive into it. I'm not going to start reading stuff like, Okay, great. I'm not going to try to make that person a chef. All right. you, I, don't, I don't want you to work how I work. I want you to work how you work. You tell me how you work, and I will change to help you. That's my job. When you hire me and pay me to help you do something, I'm not trying to push you into my system. I'm trying to change to, to fit you and give a system to whatever you want. That's what I'm really trying to do. Got it. No, nice. That's, I mean, I think that's a great approach to everything. And, you know, the more that we can adapt to our audience, whether it's in a workplace, a nutritional space, then uh, the more impactful the message will be, right? Mm -hmm. That's the goal. Nice. So um, at this point, I'd love to open it up to questions. Um, and, all right. Oh, shocking. All right. She has a question. Senorita. Yeah. All right. We practiced this before, so you got this. I'm ready. Oh, my gosh. What are we doing here? Yes. It's you Google. Google. Man. That yeah. was pretty athletic. Yeah. Well, I do work out. So. Ah, nice. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much for coming, and I found the talk very interesting. Um, one of the things I think is most interesting is how much you've talked about nutrition and how it's uh, extremely subjective. I mean, yes, yes, you can call me a baker, but for nine years I was vegetarian. Seven years of that I was Good. vegan. And that was kind of by accident, but it was also kind of because I was told by a bunch of friends that it was better for my health. I read some books on it. Sure. They all said it was better for me. Um, and then I developed hypoglycemia. Yep and really bad acid reflux, which I didn't know was caused by that. Um, I went back to eating gradually everything, and 10 years later still was hypoglycemic, still um, having problems with the acid reflux. So um, I read the blood type diet book. Okay. I'm sure you're familiar sure, with it. Sure, sure. Um, and it's like not very scientific, but you know, <laughs> I was like willing to give it a try. I'm a baker, sure. so I, I followed the, the, the recipes or you know, the instructions. And within two months, my hypoglycemia was gone. Awesome. Within three months, acid reflux all gone. Great. And now I don't follow it religiously because I, I, I've actually graduated to being a chef. I, I don't like to brag, but. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> it's totally fine. Um, but I did experiment with all this stuff. And, and what I've told people, especially people that, um, that we know that are like really hardcore vegetarians and vegans, um, is that it's not for everyone. No. And it really is a personal choice. And, and it's not about, yes, saving the planet is great and, and saving the animals is great and saving the environment is great. There's other ways I can do that yep. um, that are not going to affect how I feel every day. And um, I was just wondering what kind of advice do you offer to people when they're so um, attached to a diet, which by the way is from the Greek means way of life, they're so attached yeah. to a diet that actually is hurting them. Yeah. And they refuse for like usually moral reasons, like because of the animals, to, they won't let go of it, sure. even though it's hurting them. So a couple of things. Number one, the vegetarian vegan argument, you have to tease out ethics from health. Right. Right. Those are separate conversations. You can't, you can't believe back and forth. So I'll leave the moral ethics stuff aside. It's not what I do. I can certainly comment on it, but it's not the best use of our short time here today. The health thing is, is the easier approach. As you mentioned, it would be extremely arrogant and short-sighted for us to think all seven, seven and a half billion people have to eat the same way and that our health would be optimized eating the same way. It's undeniable 
Some people do fantastic on those diets health-wise. It's also undeniable some don't. It's pretty silly also to think you have to eat like that to be healthy. Pick your evidence point. Evolutionary biology, current clinical, uh, randomized clinical trials, it, it, none, of it, Matt, none of it lines up, right? So any of that is a win, and it's overwhelming. It's just un, you can't ignore that or even really ethically debate that, right? You can't genuinely debate that. It, it's just silly. The bigger problem I think that puts into, we as humans have been around for a long time. How could you, in an objective, logical mind, think we were the generation that figured it out? <laughs> are, are, you, are you kidding? What do you think the generation, what, what do you think someone's going to do in 10 years from now? No, no, they're the ones that figured it out. You're like, and so I think if you run this circle pattern enough, you realize, oh, what's the answer here? What's the common thread between all of it? There is no single best diet. That, that's not going to exist. It never will. There is not a single best approach. And again, why do you think you even have to do one approach your whole life? So why not go vegan, vegetarian for a year? And then go back. And then something else. Why not more? Why does it have to be one answer our whole time? Anyone that claims that a, a diet like that is the single answer for an entire generation or entire population Maybe they have good intentions in mind, but it's not the right approach. It generally doesn't help people. So the second part of your question, how do you communicate with these people that are entrenched? Number one, you can't. If people aren't ready to change, they don't change. Uh, information always helps, but it has to be genuine information. So for example, I could very easy, easily stand up here and attack those diets from a science perspective. But it, I don't do that because it doesn't help anything. People that like vegan, vegetarian are not going to be excited by that. It's not going to help anybody. People in the middle don't like it. You're going to get a lot more views on YouTube. Like you could cut a little clip out there like Dr. Galpin, and you know, blast vegetarian in Google Talk. Uh -huh. I'm not interested in that crap. It doesn't help the movement. What helps is information, right? And, and there's a ton of information out there. And being genuinely compassionate and empathetic for those people. Really trying to help them. And when they're ready, uh, again, my approach is... So when I, I have worked with vegetarian and vegan athletes. I have not once uttered any of them that we should change their diet. With exceptions of the one that has been like, hmm, I want to do this because I thought it's healthier. That person, I was like, well, why? Why did you think that? Why do you think that? OK, great. And if they have a very good reason, I'm not against it. I would go there. I will use any tool that they want. But I will never take a person that comes to me and says, look, I'm vegan. I want to be vegetarian. But this and this is going on. I want to improve my health, but I want to stay vegetarian. I would never start the conversation off about how to get them away from vegetarian. My goal is to help them succeed with what they're doing. So that's my approach. Once they do that, they're probably more likely to understand you care about them. And then they might start opening up and being like, well, really, what do you think about, you think it is healthier this way? And then I'll give them my honest opinion, but I'm not going to walk in and start pushing. Uh, when I have an athlete that comes with me with keto, and things, my goal is not to push them away from any of that stuff. I want to help them succeed with what they want to do. And if I walk up and say, like, where are you at? Scale of 1 to 10 with veg veg uh, vegetarian veganism in terms of willing to give it up, not. If they go 9, great. I'm not even going to subconsciously, I'm not going to like hit little jabs at them. I'm not even going to try. That's not, that's not what they came to me for. They came to me because they want to get better with what they're at, fine. Just like somebody that came to me with a, a carnivore diet or any other crazy diet, that's what you want to do? Great. OK, well, I'll do my best to try to help you through that. But I'm not going to try to change you unless you want to change. Then I'll listen. I'll maybe help, but that's not my goal. I don't want anyone eating. I don't want everyone believing my philosophies. Um, I'll try to help you as I can, but that doesn't help anyone. Nice. Yeah, so um, you said there's no single solution for things, uh, but also, I, well, I have like knee condition or ankle condition. I realized that there's no, even the experts say different things about. Yes. how to treat my conditions. And so you've been working with the best people uh, in that area. So uh, can you give us a tip on how to find a good doctor or nutritionist or physic? Yeah, that's, that's such a good question. I get that probably more than anything else <laughs> when I do media or in the classroom. It's, a, it's something that I wish I had perfectly solved myself, right? but I don't. You can look for red flags, though. If anybody is selling a product directly behind themselves, 
It's not, it's not a bias, it's not guaranteed wrong, but if the answer to every single person that walks in their clinic is, oh yeah, yeah, you gotta take this thing, then you'll start to be like, hmm, weird. The other ones you wanna pay attention to are the ones that are treating symptom, not problem. Right? You wanna find the ones that address the problem, and the last piece I'll say to that is, you wanna find people that are treating the entire system, not the knee. Right? Because the knee is the symptom, that's the signal, but that may not be the cause of the problem. Right? And I don't know what your knee issue is, but it might be something that, it might be because of your neck. It might be because of your right shoulder. And so you wanna find a physician that asks questions about everything, that sits you down and go, okay, you have a knee problem, tell me about the knee problem, okay, great. Well, let me see you walk. Okay, let's take this other thing. Well, tell me about your diet. Tell me, what, when do you feel the most symptoms? When are you feeling it flare up? What activities get it? Okay, great, well, let's look at your posture. Let's look at how you move. How do you sleep? What's your desk look like? What's your car ride? Are you commuting a lot? No, you commute. Okay, what's your stress? How much are you sleeping? That's, that's somebody who will fix your problem. So those are the people I look for. If, if, you, if, you're, if you go into a physician or a physical therapist and they go, okay, what's your knee problem? Oh, the back of my knee hurts when I stand up too much. Okay, great, uh, do three sets of 10 of this, like walk out, gone. Like they're not fixing anything. Or if they just walk, oh, okay, great. Um, start on these anti-inflammatories and we'll see what happens. Not gonna work, man, like not going to work. So keep walking out of those offices until you find somebody that really treats the symptom. And it's really hard, of course, I can give you personal referrals uh, to people, but I don't wanna sound like I'm plugging anybody specifically, because there's a tons of people that do this. Um, you can look up, um, I'm make, I didn't wanna say this, but I'll tell with it, I'll just say it. You can look up functional medicine now, some functional medicine practitioners are complete quacks, but a lot of them tend to be decent, and that's a good start because they tend to treat the body. Uh, it's a really bad buzz term right now. Be very careful with it. There's a lot of hot and cold on functional medicine right now. There's some bad stuff going on with that as well, but um, some of the, they at least are pushing the concept forward of treating the system. I think one of the biggest misservices we've ever done in the field of health and fitness is teaching people different body systems. You learn the muscle system, and you learn the bone system, and you learn the nervous system, because that's not how that works. And it makes people think siloed. Oh, I have a bone problem, therefore fix the bone. Well, it might be a nerve issue. It might be a gut issue. It might be, a, might be the fact that you don't sleep well. Turns out when you sleep well, all these things go away. The body works in systems. We have multiple things, right? So when you fix those big hanging fruit, everything tends to start to line up. Uh, so I would go to a physician or a therapist or whoever you're looking for that asks all the questions about the lifestyle habits, and that fixes your problem. So a long answer, but that's my real answer. Thanks. Oh, so close. Minus 10. <laughs> uh, so you talk a lot about like finding a balance within um, the choices you make and making sure that you understand the consequences of the things you do. Uh, I'm curious to understand how do you approach something like weight cutting, um, something that like UFC fighters have to do, like they just have to make a certain weight. Um, yeah. I'll give you a, a global answer and then maybe you can follow up with a specific thing because I'm not sure exactly what you're asking and so we can do a follow up here, but it's like anything else. During that extreme weight cut, and we've, we've been a part of some very extreme ones, you're talking people, um, <laughs> the closest one, the biggest one I've ever been even just peripherally a part of, we had an athlete go from 252 pounds down to 185 pounds. Right. Really? Probably had 12 weeks for that or something. Oh. Um, I've seen people though within, uh, let's say on a Tuesday, weigh-ins are usually Friday, um, you know, go from 178 to 155. Uh, I've seen 20, pen, 20 pounds cut in 24 hours or less. Of course, that's almost exclusively water, right? So the really way I manage that is you go through those periods, and I, I, I can tell a story about this. Uh, I worked with an athlete who won a gold medal in Rio, the Olympics. And about four months out or three months out, the weight just stopped coming off. And that's because she had been in a state of low calorie for 9, 10, 12 months. And we had to match that optimization with adaptation. So what we did actually is we gave her a boatload of carbohydrate, way up on calories, almost all from vegetable, and weight just started falling off. Just started 
coming up because she had been so low calorie and with generally when low calorie you get low nutrient because you just don't have quantity. We had to go the other way. So it was like, let's make the body feel better for a minute. Mm -hmm. Let's give you a couple of weeks of feeling better. And as soon as it did that, it kind of relaxed, if you will. And then the fat started falling off. And she got down, made weight, no problem, won a gold medal. She became the first American, actually, female ever to win gold medal in wrestling. So they, like, this is a huge thing. She upset a uh, 16 times straight world champion who hadn't been beat. So we, you have to match it the same way. So when my athletes come, I literally had a conversation this morning with one of mine. When you come off that hard cut thing, we have to match it with, let's restore, let's recover. Let's not balloon up to 250 <laughs> again, but let's match it there. So that's, I think, but I'm not sure what you were asking. Go ahead and follow up now. Um, I mean, th that was basically what I was asking, but um, could you speak more specific to like, um, like how do you, like after, after an event, after they start to recover, like how do you do it in a way that's yeah. like, so an up? one key, um, I had someone one time after a pretty, pretty big weight cut won a very big um, competition. She was extremely excited and uh, had been in a very, very clean diet for months. And then she sent me a picture. She was on, um, I don't know, one of those daytime talk shows or something, one of the big news things afterwards. And she sent me a picture like, they brought me in, in pizza and chocolate and all this stuff. And I'm like, do not eat that. <laughs> I'm like, yes, it's reward time, but you're going to blow up. Like this is not, and of course she ate it and very much regretted it, we'll put it that way, if you get what I'm saying. Not, not what you want to be feeling when you're on national TV. But my point is, it's just going back to the same thing. We just are increasing calories, but you can't just go off the rails. I made this mistake one time after a personal a weight cut of my own, and I went to, to, um, to a place that serves wings and beer. I was like, I have one beer and a bunch of wings and, and fries, and oh my gosh the worst, right? You feel awful. And so you, you, up, you bring in calories and you can have a little bit of a treat, but you have to work yourself back into that stuff as well. And the, the, the very detail, it's the same food, you just eat a little more. It's more vegetable, more fresh fruit, maybe a little bit more uh, fat if you want, but you're eating real whole foods. Once you do that for a little bit, then you can actually have the luxury to eat ice cream or cake or whatever little indulgence, wine, like hers was wine, okay, fine. But you can't just go off the rails and just go back from really fresh, clean foods for nine months to garbage, it, you're gonna get destroyed. So that's really what we do. It's just the same way we come back up. And you have to be careful though because about two months later it was like, yeah, so remember how you said I can have a little bit of chocolate now? Yeah, I'm pretty much eating chocolate every day, all day. Like, <laughs> all right, time to tighten back down, like come back the other way. So it's just balancing those two things. You guys, any more questions? Perfect. Well, Dr. Galpin, it was a pleasure and a privilege. Thanks so much for stopping by. And uh, yeah, guys, check out his book. It's unplugged. A few more copies right up here. And uh, yeah, feel free to hang around. Let's go get some steak because it's steak day, so let's party. Perfect. Thanks, awesome. for, being, thanks for having me.